face of my enemy. I see my brother. I see my. morning mission church how are you last week easter um, we also observed holy week for five nights before our service on friday night which was good friday a lot of teaching a lot of good responses from you guys I, I pray that the lord is speaking to all of you opening your eyes to some things we have new christians that have joined us we have people that have maybe met Christ years and years ago, but haven't followed him. I had one conversation with the fellow this past week who grew up in the church, but it feels like right now he's coming alive to the truth of Christ. So wherever you are in this process, to God be the glory, you're welcome here. We don't have any fingers of judgment pointed at you. Um, we, the church, as you join us and become part of the church, we're as broken as you are. We know Jesus. We want you to know Jesus. We want to follow him together. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Evil. It's all around us, from child abuse to selfishness, road rage to genocide. You can see it everywhere. It makes me angry, if I'm honest. It makes me want to respond many times with violence. When I see, as a father, men or women treating their children in a horrible manner in public, it, it makes me want to put hands on them. Uh, also, on a maybe a, a lesser note, I can think of several times when I'm driving with my kids and we're maybe singing a worship song or talking about the Lord or something and somebody pulls out in front of me and my peaceful demeanor goes to one of anger and violence because honestly, I'm selfish. Today, we talk about another way which offers a much better solution as well as an outcome. Let's pray and ask God to bless this time. Uh, Lord Jesus, here's what we know to be true. Those of us that know you already, we want to do the right thing. We want to obey you. We want to respond with kindness, with peace. But Lord, our, our flesh gets in the way. And we tend to respond just as the world responds. We get bitter, we get angry, we gossip, we tell lies, and we justify our process because we think since it's been done to us, we can do it in return. That's not what your word says. And so today, Lord, as we use this Romans passage as kind of a stepping off place with some other scriptures about what you say about evil, what you say about pride, how do, you, how do you teach us to respond, would you open our eyes that we might see? Would you just, we lift up to you right now the people that are married, that can use this in their own relational uh, navigation of this life. We lift up those that have children. We lift up those that have extended family, people they work with that may be difficult. And we ask Holy Spirit that only through, only through the blood of Jesus on the cross that you can do any work in us at all. And so thank you for this time. Reveal to us our sin. We don't want to live in that shameful place, but we do want to be conscious of the fact that we've offended you. And just like we talked about this past Sunday, because of the grace of Jesus Christ, we can come to you, God the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit and be counted as not guilty, as righteous. And we just praise you for that. Open our eyes that we might see. In your name we pray, King Jesus. Amen. So here's a review. Uh, I know last week it was Easter Sunday. We were in a different part of Romans. Here's, we learned in Romans 16 that there is no, Romans 12, 16, there's no room for pride in real community, which means literally that if you're struggling all the time with wanting to be right and demanding right, you may have a community of people, but let me tell you something. The relationship could be so much better with them if you were more about them and less about yourself. Today, Paul takes this mindset further to apply to those in our community and outside of our community. Hear the Word of God, Romans 12, 17, first part. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Now, as good churchies, and I define a churchy as somebody that's basically been born in the church, for those of us that are religious, for those of us that know the rights and wrongs of Sunday school and vacation Bible school and what church says, we all agree with this. We say, yeah, I mean, you're not supposed to repay evil for evil. But really, what do you do in those situations? 
How do you respond when somebody offends you, abuses you, causes you pain, lies about you, gossips about you? This is a tough one. First, we need to define evil. It's the word kakos. It means depraved. It means wicked. It means, again, if we define sin as being contrary to what God does, then in essence, everything outside of God's will is evil. It is wicked. It's contrary to God. When someone is wicked or acts in a depraved manner, you are not to respond in kind. This doesn't mean not to defend or protect yourself. Though Jesus said some radical teaching on that as well, and we'll reserve that for another sermon. But here's what it means for our understanding today. It means when someone hates you, you aren't allowed to hate them back. When someone lies about you, you aren't allowed by the gospel of God to lie about them. When someone gossips about you, you aren't allowed to gossip about them. It doesn't give you the right. So what do we return to these people that do us evil. I'm going to take you to James chapter 5. Uh, this is verse 8 and 9. This is literally the physical brother of Jesus. He grew up with Jesus. He didn't recognize him as God until later, but later in James' life, he's the leader of the local church in Jerusalem. He's a follower of his brother, of God. And here's what he says. And this is a key word. We talked about it in the previous passage in Romans 12. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. First and foremost, what you and I have to be, in, only in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, you're, you're not going to be this without the Lord just living in you and taking over everything that embodies your life. We must be patient now, uh, I don't know how patient you may be. This is something that I struggle with. This is something I have to work on every day. Second part of this verse is this. Strengthen, build up your hearts. And the third one is this. Don't complain. And uh, in my opinion, gossiping is the child of complaints. Okay? If you begin to complain about a situation, really what you're doing a lot of times is gossiping about how a person has handled something or how they've responded. And what the church people do is they will put this under the auspice of sharing. Hey, can I share with you this situation so you can pray for this brother or sister? Bottom line, it's gossip and it shows a weakness of your heart and a weakness of mine. Uh, and here's the last part of that James passage right here. Look, the judge stands at the door. Um, God judges all of us. So here's the bottom line. If I deeply, deeply offend you and you choose by God's grace not to get me back but to actually do what the rest of these scriptures are going to tell us to do today, which is a positive, encouraging, caring action. If you choose to do that, God's going to judge me. God's going to deal with me. And His, His judgment is much more painful and much more extracting than yours. You're not called to be the judge. You should take this weight off your shoulders and realize everybody that's done you wrong, listen to me, you don't have to hate them anymore. You don't have to tell lies about them because if they're telling lies, you need to tell lies. And if they're gossiping, you need to, you just take that burden off your shoulders right now and, and say with me right now, God is the judge. God is in control. God is in charge. I no longer have to be the judge and jury over my whole life. Uh, the next one is this. Um, don't complain. We already covered that. God judges us. Listen to what Paul said also is 1 Thessalonians 5, 14b and 15. Here's the second passage. Be patient with everyone. Again, there's an iteration again of being patient. This is crucial. See to it that no one repays evil for evil to anyone, but always, and here's another piece, pursue what is good for one another and for all. Again, be patient. Uh, what does this mean? Remember that you, what you have done and what you are like. My patience is strengthened by in a moment when someone offends me or does evil to me, I remember who I was pre-Jesus. Heck, I remember who I was last week. The capacity I have to do evil, the abilities I've used in my own strength to harm people, 
to hurt people is overwhelming, so much so that it condemns me to hell. But Jesus, what we talked about on Easter Sunday, through His redemption on the cross, frees me from that. It no longer has to be my weight, and it no longer has to be yours. Um, Pursue what is good for all people. Paul's not saying here that we just pursue what is good for the people we like. Paul literally says for all people. You mean I should do good things for those who have done evil to me, Pastor Tom? Yeah, I actually do. Here's what happens. You, you should really be praying for it. So literally, as somebody offends you, lies about you, hurts you in some way, you begin to pray for the blessing of God to be upon that person. Lord, this person at work has slandered me and has told the boss horrible things about me, which are not true. I ask, Lord, that you would bless them with your presence. I ask, Lord, that you would love them. I ask, Lord, that you would give me an opportunity to do something for them that reflects your glory. I ask them, Lord, that you would allow me to bless those that have hurt me. This is way harder than it sounds, amen? You should actually pray for that opportunity. Here's an application of these, of these two verses right here. Be patient. Wait to respond. Remember in Nehemiah we covered that we pray, we process, we plan, and then we proceed with action. Uh, a lot of times emotional and visceral response in the moment will get you nowhere anyway. So if people are doing something evil to you, back up. You don't have to trust them. You don't have to keep yourself in their, in their life in that moment. But begin to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, I'm not sure what to do right now. Lord, I'm being hurt right now. Lord, I'm being offended right now. And the one who covers you and never leaves you, he's going to rise up in your defense. He's going to take your side and he's going to speak into you the power and ability to actually bless that person that is hurting you. The second one is this application of those two verses. Weak hearts are impatient. We're to strengthen our heart, right? Well, a weak heart is impatient, and this is me. This is me. I, my family has to call me to the carpet on this. My friends, my staff have called me to the carpet on this. You're being impatient, Tom. You're wanting it your way right now. You know what? That's a sign of my weak heart, not my strong heart. Um, strong hearts are patient. What kind of a heart do you have? 2 Timothy 2 says this, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Well, you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Commit to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. Did you catch this? How do we strengthen our hearts? How do we become strong Christians so that we can be a little bit more, I don't know, less offended by evil and calling into the fact that, that the God of the ages is on our side? How do we do that? We return to grace. It's not a how-to process. We return to grace. This past Holy Week, we talked about Jesus' work on the cross. I've had several conversations with people about one thing we covered in Holy Week, and it was this. When we said, Jesus said from the cross, as He is bearing the sins of you and me, as He literally, Scripture says, became those sins, He cries out this. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is where grace came from. What was happening in this moment is that Jesus Christ, who is equal member of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, before time began, had a perfect relationship with each other. Complete peace, complete harmony, complete care, complete agape Love And what the Bible says is that sin has to be paid for. So what happened on the cross, what we see is that Jesus, the perfect one, who had always had harmony with his Father, is in a place where sin of the world, your sin, my sin, is upon him. Which means that he could feel what it was like to be a liar and he never lied. He could feel what it felt like to beat a murderer but he never murdered anyone. He had your sin and my sin upon him. And what the father had to do is he had to bear down his wrath upon him. Jesus, the perfect one, took the wrath of God the Father that was due you and due me. 
He didn't do anything wrong. You and I did. And yet Jesus is the one who said, God, let your wrath come upon me for the sins of all of these people. Listen to me. That is grace. In moments when you and I are experiencing pain and hurt from others, you and I have to go back to grace. We have to remember that all the sins we've committed against others, Jesus took those upon His own self and suffered the wrath from His own Father. The one that had loved Him forever now bore down His wrath upon Him that you and I might be free. Now speaking of Jesus, what did He say to do when we are wronged? I'm going to take you to Matthew 18. Some of you know the verses I'm about to read, but let's go through them and talk about conflict resolution. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and rebuke them in private. If they listen to you, you've won your brother or sister, but if they won't listen, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If they don't pay attention to them, tell the church they don't pay attention. Even to the church, let them be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you, which meant the relationship was over. Does it it mean that you stop loving them? It doesn't mean that you stop looking for opportunities to care for them. It just means, hey, you get no access to my heart anymore. You You won't have any opportunities to hurt me because the relationship is over. Here's the stages of conflict resolution. First one, and I pushed it to first after I studied this, establish your facts. A lot of us just kind of go shoot from the hip. Somebody said something, we think they meant something, and therefore because we think they meant something, they said we say something that we mean. And we get ourselves in in very, very hot water. Establish your facts. Ask yourself, I've had to do this just recently. Um, I've had to do this a ton because my mind just goes to weird places. And I'm thinking, what did they mean when they said? Why would they have said that? Well, if they meant that, then this is what I think. And I have an argument with people in my mind, and they're not even present. And that mindset carries over into the relationship so that when I'm in front of them, my response is rather derogatory or to return evil for evil. It's not what God wants us to do. Establish your facts. Ask yourself what really happened. Pray about this as Nehemiah did. Lord, I have no idea what to do right now. This person has offended me. I don't know what to say, but you know what to say. Will you help me now go over what happened that I might discern the right thing to do? Here's the second one. And listen, I firmly believe that if we just do this second one, it will alleviate most of the problems. Not all of them, because I've done this many times and the result has been disastrous, but we're still to obey the word. Here's what Jesus says we're to do. Go to them directly first. It means if your boss has offended you, you need to sit down with them, no matter if that stinks or not. No matter if that's hard on you, you may say, well, Tom, I don't like any type of conflict. Well, um, sorry, conflict is a part of life. And also, conflict is a part of adult life, and conflict is a part of a strong heart. If you have a weak heart, and that's where you're going to stay, then you're not going to be a lot of service to your family in that regard. But if you want to protect your children, if you want to protect your spouse, if you want to protect your friends and your future, then you're going to have to have a strong heart. And that strong heart is found in the grace of God, and conflict resolution is going to be a part of that. In fact, Jesus, how He sets it up, it's actually a good thing. It actually serves people. Okay, I know that I've had people come to me and sit down with me and say, here's how you offended me and here's what happened. And they give me specific facts and they're speaking to me in a tone like this. Now, when they come at me angry, that brings a different response in me, maybe in you too. So it's our response that when we go to the person that's offended us, we go with the right tone and we go with the right volume. And we simply present it to the person and say, hey, Remember last Tuesday when? Like, that really hurt my feelings, and here's why. Or that offended me deeply. Can you help me understand really what happened there? Go to them directly. Third one is this. If that doesn't work, if their response is, and I've had this response, that's not what happened. I disagree with you. You're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. 
if we're inside the church, if we're here in the community of the body of Christ, and there's a lot of arguments and disagreements inside the body of Christ with people that call themselves believers. If we're going to do this, we go to them directly, but sometimes people are going to disagree. What Scripture says we're to do is we're, we're, going, to, we're going to take one or two others with us. Now, at that juncture, you're going to have to let them know what happened. And guard yourself in that because you'll be even tempted in that moment to gossip and to shade it in your direction. Be mature. Have a strong heart in the grace of God. Realize that you've been forgiven much, that you've given much grace, and what your desire is, is to show this person grace, not to administer judgment to them. You want resolution. You want this friendship to be healed, to be connected again. This is what Jesus did for me and you. We ran from Him. He ran to us. We sinned against Him. He bore our sin for us. So resolution is the desire. Go to them with one or two other people, not for judgment, again, for resolution. If they don't respond well to that, go to the leadership of the church. If they don't respond well to that, the relationship is over and you're still called to love them. You're still called to love them. You just don't have to give them access to your heart anymore. I'm convinced that the church obeys this command, this precept, our communities will be gossip-free. I'm convinced that if we as staff in Mission Church, and we've done this, we as leaders at Mission Church, we as people of Mission Church, those of you that are out there right now listening uh, just around the United States and the globe, if you choose to do this, you being a part of the body of Christ, are doing your piece to create a gossip-free zone. And what happens when people know you're not a gossip, is their comprehension of your integrity goes up. And guess what then? As a believer, they're going to come to you in hard times and you're going to get to share with them the grace that you have. You're going to get to share with them where your strong heart comes from because of this response. Re resolution in this situation would be the norm not the exception. Resolution with those outside the body of Christ using these precepts will result in reflecting Jesus to those He is calling, not pushing them away from the salvation of Jesus Christ. Church, I know this is what you want, but you have to ask yourself again, how does the rest of the world see you? Who are you on a weekly basis? What are you like in traffic? This is indicting to me. What do you like behind closed doors around your family? What kind of grade would your spouse give you right now in this department? That's a tough one. I know I've gotten a lot of derogatory grades in my home because of my actions I've chosen. I don't want to do that anymore. It's time for us, you and me, to return to grace. That's the answer. Not being a stronger person, not reading more self-help books. It's returning to grace. It's rolling over again in your mind the understanding of what Jesus did on the cross and how He lived for you and dies for you, died for you, and now prays for you daily. Second part of the verse, give the careful thought to what, is, to what is honorable, to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Now the word is kalos in Greek. Here's what honor means because what the problem with this is, is we decide what honor is. The problem also is, is that we decide who gets that honor. But what Scripture says right here is give careful thought, really chew on this and pray about it, to do what is honorable, that means to everyone, in everyone's eyes. You and I are called to do the right thing. We're called to treat people the right way. Everyone's eyes. It means beautiful. So showing honor is doing a beautiful thing. It's not just a tit-for-tat type of response. It means moral good. It means valuable. It means worthy. Worthy of whom? Of Jesus and the grace that He's given. So the honor that you're going to give to those that know Jesus should be worthy of the grace that Jesus has given us and the honor you're called to give to those that don't know Jesus, that are evil, that are angry, that are an issue, is also to be worthy, not of their honor, but of Christ's honor and His calling upon our lives. Um, most of the time we believe that honor goes to those honorable. It's not what Paul is saying here. 
Literally, we are to honor all people. That's called the Christian. Paul says, everyone's eyes, the Christian and the non-Christian. So we're not just trying to impress those in our Christian bubble. We're trying to, not an impress is the wrong word, we're trying to impress upon the right way to do things with our neighbors. Maybe you have neighbors. I'm pointing to my neighbors right now. I'm in my house. Is this being shot? I have neighbors that don't know Jesus. It's super important for me to honor them regardless of what they do. Why? Because God honored me regardless of what I've done. It's a, it's a return on that. This is going way beyond even what the world would call sacrificial. Romans 12.10, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. Agape love brings about godly honor. It's easy, again, to love people that love you back. How hard is it to love those that don't love you back? Herein is where Christians should just flourish. We should be the ones leading in this. First Peter 2.17, Peter kn knows what Jesus meant, and he takes even what Paul says a little further. Honor everyone. There it is. It's not conjecture. Scripture says that. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. He's given pieces of how we honor all people. It's not just family. It's everyone. The second one is fear God who honors you daily. And the third one is honor the ruler of your land. And guys, that's Trump. So some of y'all right now that love Trump, you're saying, yeah, he's the best Things since sliced bread. Some of y'all that hate his guts are like, well, I'm not so sure. Listen, it doesn't matter who's in office. We're called to honor them. We're called to honor Barack Obama when he was president. We're called to honor Donald Trump now as he is president and whomever may come in the future, regardless of where their hearts are. God in his sovereignty has allowed them to rule. Therefore, we're to honor them. Colossians 3.17 um, just kind of brings it together and whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. How are we going to accomplish this honor of everyone? By giving thanks and only in the name of Jesus and only in the power of Jesus and only in the daily and hourly and minute by minute worship of Jesus, remembering His grace and distributing that grace. The last Versus this, but it really is it's already summarized in the first two. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We all want peace. Let me tell you something. Even broken, violent people want peace. They're just so damaged and nervous and fearful that they act in a way that's unbecoming their true heart. The prescription for this peace is twofold, and, and we'll be done. Um, the first one is this. See above on how to return honor and love for evil. This is, this is a prescription, a narrative that takes us to a place of peace. And the second one is this, enjoy and praise God for shalom, for peace, when it is present. Last verse of the day, 1 Timothy 6. But godliness with contentment, with contentment. How many of you are content right now? Well, I mean, if I get toilet paper at Costco tomorrow, Pastor Tom would be good. Well, if we can get more groceries. Well, if I get my job back. Well, if we get that new minivan. Well, if we, if, 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 if there's no contingency on this. I can take you to countries around the world where people have nothing. And I've seen greater contentment than in our own 48. Okay? Contentment is based on godliness, recognizing that the king of the universe has given you these things and therefore you are content. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. Peace, contentment, so valuable. You had nothing when you arrived. You will have nothing when you leave. Relax, church. Be thankful. Breathe. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the power of your grace. Lord, may we as believers come back to the fact of what you did, of how you lived, what you suffered for us. And therefore, there's nothing, there is nothing that we can suffer that we cannot experience your grace. Therefore, Lord, as people hurt us, as they talk bad about us, as they lie, as they gossip, 
may we come back with this incredible righteous offense of caring for them and honoring them and holding them accountable too, Lord. We want to do that. So in all these things, we give you pray, great, grace, praise, honor, and glory. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us peace, that you would give us rest in the moment, rest this afternoon, in our minds, in our hearts, and in our bodies. In your name we pray, King Jesus. Amen. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, and he was betrayed because of your sin and my sin. He was betrayed because man could not keep the covenant. And so Jesus had to come and form a new covenant uh, with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit that would be 100% what they did and nothing that you did so that the covenant could never be broken. And his covenant was going to be based on what was happening the next day. And he was letting his disciples know that he was about to, um, he was about to walk into a time where he was going to be hung on the cross and his life was going to be used as a ransom for your sin and mine. He'd already explained this to him several times. They didn't get it. They didn't hear. I don't think Jesus allowed them to know yet. But they had this last meal. He had already washed their feet, which is crazy for a rabbi, for a leader to do. And he sat down with them and he had the bread. And it was like a, a flat, hard bread, yeastless. And he broke it and he passed it around to everybody. And he said, listen, um, this is my body and it's about to be broken for you. And in the future, when you eat bread together, remember me. And I think he was saying in that moment, remember how I lived, but also remember my grace. Because in retrospect, they were going to have the cross uh, in their rear view. They were going to see and remember what Jesus did. And they were going to remember that he had come back from the dead on the third day, presenting his hands and his side to them, them seeing the marks in his head where the thorns had been crushed in. So. Pick up whatever food you may have. Um, this is a tortilla today. Um, pick up whatever food you have and, and repeat this with me. Jesus, I remember your body broken for me. On the same night and at the end of the meal, he went and had like a simple wine container, probably had some form of wine in it, who knows what it was. And um, he lifted it to his disciples and he said, this is my blood shed for you and in the future when you drink wine, when you gather and you eat and you drink, I want you to remember me. I want you to remember my blood shed because without the shedding of blood, the disciples knew there was no forgiveness of sins. Blood, physical blood had to be shed. And that's what they were about to see in volumes. So raise whatever symbolic drink you have with me right now representing the blood of Jesus and repeat after me Jesus we remember your blood shed for us let's pray Lord we thank you so much that you gave your life as ransom for ours and what's crazy about that is your life was perfect and ours never has been and so we thank you for grace. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for the beauty and power of your life and how for 33 plus years you lived a perfect one. You were tempted like we were. You never sinned. So when you went to the cross, Lord Jesus, the sacrifice was enough. And we know that God, your Father, His wrath bore down on you for what we had done. So, Father, as we navigate the waters of hurt and offense and evil from others, may we remember the evil we have offended you with. May we remember the pain and the suffering we have caused not only you, but others in our lives. And, Father, may that give us the right perspective that as people give us evil, we give them, as you did, grace and mercy and agape love. We praise you and we honor you. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you rest as you experience evil and you choose with a strong heart that Christ has given you to not return evil with evil, but to return evil with God's grace. Amen and amen. Have a great day.